So now to the topics of the hour. Uh, without further ado, please give a well, warm remote welcome to our first speaker, Tammy Fox, who will be speaking about pasture-raised turkeys for beginners. Tammy? Great. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm really happy to talk to you about one of my favorite things to do on the farm, and that's to take a look at um, our turkeys. So on our first slide is just an overview of, um, I think this is actually Rob's hands, holding on to um, some brand new couple of day old baby turkeys. These are broad breasted bronze turkeys. I'll talk about turkey selection um, here for a minute before we move on to the next slide. Um, one of the first things to consider when you're looking at raising turkeys um, is your room environment and then um, you know what kind of physical environment do you want them in and then what kind of and what kind of birds you have depends on that physical environment. One of our priorities on our farm, um, we're genuine fox farm, we're located in um, near Tripola, which is in the northeast part of the state. We have a few acres of pasture available. Um, it's just kind of grassland that we let them um, out and graze on. We thought the grazing was a really important piece for us. Um, and I should say grazing kind of turkeys. They do graze, but um, it's really important for them to have outdoor space, um, in our opinion, to run around, bugs to chase, or each other to chase, um, clover to munch on. Um, so that <clears throat> affected our choice of birds. We looked at options um, and we thought, okay, the white turkeys are the super hybridized, the ones that everybody thinks turkeys are stupid. Um, turkeys are actually not stupid. They're um, considered a very smart wild bird. Um, what we went is kind of an in-between. These are broad-breasted bronzes. They are a hybridized bird. They do not easily reproduce, um, but they are also meant to be out on pasture. So. Um, that was our choice since we knew we wanted them on pasture. We didn't go with the whites, which are not as good out on pasture is my understanding. And, um, and they're just so cute. If you could go to the next slide. Turkeys come to us in the mail. We order them. Um, we order ours through Hoover's Hatchery in Rudd and then they actually subcontract out. They don't hatch them at Rudd anymore. They come to us in the mail. They're typically um, hatched on Sunday and they arrive to us by Tuesday. Um, you can have them in the mail for up to three days for broilers. If it's more than two days for turkeys, I start to get really nervous. Um, so these are two day old birds that come in a box. It's really important with turkeys to keep them warm. Um, people have said to me, oh, turkeys are hard to raise. I'm not sure I can raise turkeys. Um, heat. Um, heat and keeping them dry in their first month are probably the two keys to raising birds successfully. So um, I, you need to, and they're a little bit different from broilers, um, from chickens, you need to keep their heat at about 95 degrees um, and not just under the light, but the whole brooder area needs to be kept at about 95 degrees. And then you start lowering it um, and allowing it to get a little bit cooler, a couple of degrees a week for about the first four, maybe depends on your outdoor temperature, four to six weeks. For that reason, we don't get our Turks until June. I want it to be the heat of summer um, before we get them because trying to keep a room at 95 degrees, any space, no matter how insulated, is a challenge. So we get them in mid-June. They go for about 18 weeks. And um, so in the space of about 18 weeks, by the middle of October, they go from looking like this to, we'll see the pictures at the end, but they end up processing out, the females process out at about um, a process weight of between 15 and 18 pounds and the males probably you know, 12 to 18. The males end up being about 15 to, we've had them in 18 weeks get as big as 30 pounds processed weight. Um, so what you see here is we've got our brooder room subdivided. We've got some walls set up so that we've got about 70 turkeys in the space that's about four by four. We've got a single heat lamp because it was a warm summer. You could do a double heat lamp. Red heat lights tend to uh, keep the birds calmer than white heat lights. Um, this is their first day in. Part of, I mentioned keeping them warm. We would put, if it's cool outside, we would put a lid over the top of this. You still have to have air circulating around the brooder um, to 
keep some fresh air in there, but this really keeps the heat in um, and it's far enough off the ground. You need to give some space so that their backs aren't touching the heat light. Um, there's also water in there. It's really important to keep the water fresh. Um, turkeys will, once you've got them on bedding, they'll scratch up the bedding. They, the bedding will fly around and they follow their water fairly quickly. So we typically don't do any supplements to water. Sometimes I might add some apple cider vinegar. Um, probably I use a ratio of close to a tablespoon for about two gallons. So it's really diluted, but I don't do that all the time. I've honestly never seen a difference. Um, when you first put the turkeys into this brooder space, they need to have a fairly solid, soft, but solid space. So I've got um, a bedding. This is a cement floor. I've got straw and then I've got wood chips over top of the straw, pine, don't use cedar, um, shavings, and then I've got newspaper over that for the first two days. Pull that out um, and then they're, they're on the pine shavings for about two to three weeks and then they're just on straw um, after that. Feed for them, it's important to have look for a specific poultry or wild game feed. We have ours custom made by Earl Canfield, um, who's a little bit south of us. And we start them out for the first four weeks with about a 27 to 28% protein. That's another trick people, again, they're hard to raise. Heat, keep them dry, make sure you're changing out their bedding and refreshing their bedding, clean water, and then high protein for about the first four weeks. Um, if you can go to the next slide. You've got to give them some space. These guys grow really quickly. Um, so this is their, their first day in their new bigger room. This is about a 20 by 20 room. They've got a lot of straw um, to move around on. And then at about, you can go to the next slide. At about um, eight weeks or so, um, they're out on pasture. Again, when we put them out, depends on how warm it is outside. They need to be feathered um, before they go out so they can keep themselves warm and dry. They go into the room at night. They need a little help learning how to go into the room and we're out there shooing them in. Um, we have an electric fence around the pasture. This is just a grass and clover pasture and they will do a great job once they're out there. You don't need to mow the pasture. They um, will crop off all of that grass and clover really nicely. They love wandering around. They chase after moths. Um, the electric fence only does a minimal amount to keep them in. They will herd rush an electric fence. You do need to provide some supports to the fence so they don't gang rush it. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is the turkeys. They're really excited to see us. They're very social creatures. They'll come running towards you. And then... Um, This is what they look like um, about a week before they're going to the processor. To process them, we load them into the back of a pickup truck and take them up to green to do the processing. The final tip I'll mention just in this really fast overview, if you know you're raising turkeys and you want to have them processed, if you want to sell them, you do need to, um, other than direct to consumer, you need to have a certified locker. Um, we go up to green and um, do not wait until the last minute um, plan. As soon as you order your turkeys, get your processing date set as well. I love the turkeys. They're an awful lot of fun to raise. I'd be happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, we're gonna move right now to uh, Rob Fox. And Rob is be talking about filling nooks and crannies with annual pollinator habitat. So Rob. Hey, it's good to be here. It just it just so happens that I'm related to somebody who raises turkeys. Um, in any event, I, I do a lot with pollinators. It's very important to me that we support them. And the first slide you see here is actually not an annual flowering plant, but it was such a good picture I had to include it. What you're seeing here is a perennial aster with a honeybee flying next to it. And the point I wanted to make with that slide just to begin with is on our farm, we actually let some areas go. It's sometimes it's hard when you're, when you're a grower, you wanna have some control over everything that's going on. You want it to look fairly good. 
and just letting something go is actually something that pollinators need. And so just wanted to point out, letting some of those areas go, not trying to control them, might be the best thing you can do for your pollinators. Let's look at the next slide. So with this slide, I wanted to make the point that you can do things with pollinator support and natural habitat, both inside high tunnels or outside in your fields. On the left-hand side, you'll see I've got two rows of tomatoes in our high tunnel. And if you look down towards the path area, there is sweet alyssum growing at the bases of these plants. And that provides a little bit of a pollinator boost. Uh, it covers the ground. So one of the things it does do for us is once they get established, they make a mat and they prevent other weeds from starting to germinate in there. They don't really inhibit the plants at all because they have a different root zone. They have different requirements. They don't need to grow up like the tomatoes do. Uh, the only couple problems that we've had with this is of course they start getting so big they get into the path and you might be tripping over that a little bit. So if you do, you just go in there and you rip a couple out and you're still perfectly fine. Uh, and then the second problem, of course, is they do reseed. So you need to be aware that the next year you're gonna have a crop of alyssum popping up maybe where you don't want it. You just have to be prepared to control it. Uh, on the right-hand side is Cleome, which we put on the borders of a couple of our, uh, couple of our fields. Uh, they, they're a good attractant for all kinds of insects and they just look nice. Let's look at the next slide. Okay, this is, this is actually a lawn area on our farm. Every, every homestead has a lawn area. And what we did is we, we actually have a lot of clover in this lawn. And so we started treating this like a crop. This isn't an annual, but it's part of our farm. And so we started letting it go through a peak bloom. And then once that bloom starts to fade, that's when we mow it. So we let this area go, we let it bloom, the pollinators love it, they start to die off, we mow it. And that often encourages a second bloom for us later in the year when maybe we could use a little more pollinator support. Let's go to the next one. One of the areas that we use the most because it's the easiest are the edges of our fields, which you see in front of you is some borage. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent uh, native uh, habitat creating plant. You'll get all kinds of critters like frogs and toads and snakes and whatever on the base and all kinds of insects. In the background, you'll see zinnias. Uh, but borders of fields are just the easiest place, especially in a vegetable, vegetable operation, to just put something that promotes pollinators and provides habitat for beneficials of all sorts. So the minimum you could do here, get something on the edges. Uh, let's go to the next one. So here's, we take the next step with this field, instead of just having it in the edges, we start actually having rows of pollinator support in our field, we treat them like a crop. So on the left hand side, it's kind of hard to see, there's some buckwheat over on the left, there's some zinnia in the left center, borage on the right center, and a little bit further over you would see calendula if the picture were good enough. This is a field of melons. And this is the year that we decided to reduce the number of melon plants by one third and just put these rows of flowers in the middle of the field. And we expected to lose some of our production, but instead we actually got one third higher production when we had this much localized support for pollinators. Well, let's go to the next one. So another thing that we do is we like to put nasturtium and I'm not talking about vining nasturtium, I'm talking about mounding nasturtium. I like to put those with squashes and they can grow in the understory of squash. And what we're seeing here is a nasturtium after we've had a frost. And the frost killed a lot, of course, those squash leaves, but the nasturtium was still there thriving well. And one of the things nasturtium is reported to do is it helps reduce vine borer problems. I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but it does seem to help some. Let's go to the next one. So here's a picture of some pumpkins and it's next to some sweet corn and we've got some zinnias in the middle of it. And there's probably nasturtiums in the understory that you can't see in this picture. It's just an example that things don't always have to be a nice neat looking rose. I mean, squash never allows it to stay in a neat looking roam anyway, but they'll roam into the sweet corn and they'll plow right over the zinnias. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful habitat. There's all kinds of diversity going on here and you still get a decent crop. Uh, let's move on to the next one. 
Now, the other thing you can do is you can put things in row, like the nasturtiums would be about every third plant I put a nasturtium next to the squash. Here's an example where we've got marigolds and broccoli. And you can use this, you could use plants like zinnias or marigolds or anything like this as a divider. So if you have different varieties in a row, plop a flowering plant in there to, to make the differentiation between the two different varieties. Or if you're a cooperator doing research, put some flowers in there to mark the different replications in your, in your research study. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt anything. It's, it's better than a tag usually because it's a lot easier to see and it makes you happier when you're doing your work. Uh, let's go one more here. All right, here's two examples. Uh, on the left, you see tomatoes and there's a young row of basil that just got planted in there. So sometimes your cash crops can be something that provides habitat for your pollinators and the basil's one. That's a 200 foot row of basil and I'll have probably three more of those in the same field. We don't have that much demand for basil so we don't have to cut them all. We can let some of them flower and let them be pollinator habitat. On the right hand side, you'll see sunflowers on the right and you'll see lettuce on the left. And that, those sunflowers on the west side of the lettuce. So they provide shade during the heat of the day. Uh, so you can use your pollinator habitat to do things to help you with your crops. Let's go to the last slide. And of course, if you've got pollinator habitat, it doesn't have to just be for the pollinators, it can be you too. Uh, we both love to go outside and see the sunflowers, see the borage, see all these different colors on our farm. It makes us happy to be out there. Uh, so if you're happy to be out in your field because you're seeing all this diversity, I would hazard to guess the pollinators are pretty happy too. And that should conclude what I have to say. Okay. Thank well, you so much, Rob. Uh, appreciate it a lot. And we're going to move to our next speakers. Um, we're going to move to Jordan, Emily, hopefully, and uh, Hannah, who will be ex talking about experimenting with um, no-till veggie production. Okay, so I'm Jordan Scheibel, Middleway Farm, and I'm going to be first. And uh, we're going to split up our presentation. So I'm going to talk for four minutes, and then uh, Hannah and Emily will talk for four minutes. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we did, the, uh, we are doing this research as part of a SARE grant, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, which is a uh, part of USDA. And so we got a farmer rancher grant together. So to, we're doing a two farm collaboration. Um, and so that's a two year grant. So we're at the end of our, our first year. Um, and then uh, we'll be submitting a mid year report. And then next year we'll we'll do our next iteration, and then we'll we'll be done with that with that grant. But these are available every year that you can apply for them. And um, I think the deadline is usually like November, December, and you can get them directly as a farmer. And it's basically to do research on your farm. And I would Rob's done a bunch of them, I know. So I'd highly encourage people to apply for those. Uh, next slide. So I know this is a quick presentation, but I wanted to lay the groundwork for what I did on my farm. So. We're talking about four foot wide beds by 100 feet, 18 inch pathways, 30 inch bed tops. I did three different uh, kind of replicate or three different treatments, let's say. So the first treatment was what I just called rototill no compost. So I just prepared the bed as I would. This was bed that had not previously been tilled or hadn't been tilled for a few years. So I chisel plowed, rototilled, made raised beds, did my normal amendments to the bed. Um, the next uh, set, I did what I called compost and till. So I actually um, uh, uh, laid out one to two inches of compost and then tilled that in. Um, and then the final treatment was uh, no till and compost. So I basically just laid that compost on top of the soil and didn't do any tilling. Um, otherwise they were, they got the same amendments beside the, besides the compost. And I, I just, I seeded different crops into different um, treatments. So I didn't really control between the treatments. Like I didn't do like five beds of carrots in each one. And that's something I'm going to think about doing next year is trying to do a little bit more replication between, between the treatments. Next slide. So uh, this is the initial bed building. So I purchased uh, compost from Cosmo, as did uh, Hannah and Emily. Um, and so bought that by the truckload, got it delivered to the farm. Um, and then we just spread that by wheelbarrows. Um, 
we actually, one trick is we take a, the bucket of the tractor and, and pick up the compost. And then we, we put three wheelbarrows underneath the bucket and then dump the, the bucket into the wheelbarrows. And actually doing that at the edge of the field means that any of the compost that kind of spills is still in the field. So that's a good way to do that if you uh, don't have a way to spread mechanically in the field. Um, but we're looking to get a pretty thick layer of compost, so one to two inches, so you cannot see the, the soil underneath. And then um, just used a tilther, which is uh, not a um, gas-powered rototiller. It's just a small rototiller that's uh, powered by a drill. So it really just kind of churns up, and it's more like a, I would call it like a power rake. It kind of smooths and uh, smooths the surface, but it doesn't really till into the soil. And one of the difficulties I ran into is having to add enough compost on top of relatively compacted ground to be able to get enough tilth to be able to run a cedar or a paper pot transplanter through the soil. Next slide. So this is the uh, till and compost treatment. So you can say we laid the thick layer of compost down and then um, tilled it with the BCS. So you can say we're not doing full bed tillage, just tilling on top of the bed top and leaving the pathways um, untilled. Uh, next slide. And then this is uh, what I called uh, till and no compost. So uh, use the chisel plow to break it up and then tilled it with the with the tractor. So full width tillage and then actually use the BCS to form to form raised beds. Next slide. So we had a really heavy rain. I think it was Cristobal was the name of the the remnants of the hurricane. And it was like the, it was a hurricane that it was the farthest like um, west a hurricane had ever gone in terms of like just kind of went straight north through the Gulf and stayed west instead of curving east. And so we got like four inches of really pounding rain in early June. And, and so I kind of I took pic pictures of each of the different treatments to show that, you know, the tilled was the most beat up. The no till with compost sort of you can see the compost sort of acted as a mulch to kind of cover the soil and keep it from crusting over as badly. And then next slide. And then this is the till with compost. So you can see that that sort of in between the two that um, that the, the compost did sort of act as a mulch, but it but it also moved around a little bit more. But you can see each all of them were beat up. So this kind of is showing that, um, yeah, I'm I'm right at where I'm right at four minutes. So let's let's go to the next slide. I'll just go through the rest of these quickly. So we use the tarp in between. Um, uh, use the tarp in between um, uh, plantings um, to try to reduce tillage. Um, you can see I had some uh, germination issues between the tilled and the no-till, like getting enough tilth to be able to run a cedar was, was a problem. Next slide. Just some pictures of, of some of the production out of, out of uh, the different types of treatments. So the, the carrots were a little bit difficult in the no-till, had some compaction issues, had really great spinach coming out of the tilled with compost. Next slide. Oops. Yeah, so just uh, quickly the takeaways. I think that kind of tillage is required to set you up for successful no-till. That's one of my discoveries. I think just not tilling at all and then trying to go straight into no-till. While possible, I think it's, it's, it, there's a lot of setbacks the first year. If you stick with it, the tilth will come. But, um, but yeah, tilling initially can be a good way to start with no-till. Um, keeping the no-till beds clean, so weeding them, that makes the turnover much quicker. If you're used to just rototilling in weeds, you can't do that with a no-till bed. So you have to think more about keeping them clean. And then when you're doing your final harvest, actually like picking out the crop while you're doing that. And then I did do a soil test at the end of the year. It was interesting to see that the soil health indicators kind of went as you would expect. The no-till was the highest, the till with compost was the next highest, and then the tilled was the lowest. Okay, I'll turn it over to Hannah and Emily. Awesome. Yeah. So Emily somehow couldn't get on today. So it's just me talking. Um, but this is a picture of our, um, our very first experiment in no-till, um, which was um, just a, a whim that I had April of 2019. Um, and, um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to dig out four beds of no-till just to see if it works. And um, it turned out that, okay, what Jordan said about tilling first, like you can see how cloudy this is uh, before, you know, this is before we could till in the field. Um, but um, yeah, tilling first would be, would have been a great thing. Um, but this, this kind of whim um, ended up really working for us. In 2019, we had a lot of rain in the spring and couldn't 
like couldn't get into this part of the field at all, except in these no-till beds um, that had been that I had prepared um, in April. Um, so, um, so that's kind of what inspired us to um, to look into no-till more. Is like, oh, this might be a solution for kind of the extreme weather events that we're starting to get used to experiencing. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so the way we have been um, doing these beds is to create a pathway using a shovel, um, never have to use the shovel again, except the one, one time. And then we have lay, we lay compost over the top for tilth. Um, uh, in ever since that first time we have um, tilled before we make the beds, which makes it pretty, pretty easy to just run through with a shovel. Um, we make our beds 30 inches wide with uh, 20 inch um, pathways, more or less. Um, and this picture has us putting down paper mulch below the compost, um, which um, was really a, a good choice for keeping annual weeds from coming up through the compost. But um, we also happen to have a dry spring this year. Um, and so some of that compost blew away and we had ended up um, uh, seeding carrots into it. And so our, our germination was kind of um, spotty in these tilled, in these no-till um, direct seeded places. But the, um, the paper mulch worked really well for, um, for transplants, um, as long as we poked through the paper, got the transplants into the soil underneath. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so we use a silage tarp um, to help um, break down the, help keep the thistles, we have a lot of thistle problems, help keep the thistles um, at bay. So we try to uh, silage tarp areas for as long as we can. Um, next slide. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to stop it because we are sort okay, of trying ahead. to keep it. Yeah, um, I do appreciate. Talk to us somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, though, for that information. And we're going to move to uh, Jan Libby, uh, who will be All speaking right. today about the Food Box Meal Kit Pilot Program. Right. Oh, thank you very much. Glad to be here and uh, share some of the challenges and opportunities that we learned. This is the team that I worked with. Um, it was a project from North Iowa Fresh, which is a food hub um, about, owned by about eight producers in North Central Iowa, marketing um, a CSA product called the Bounty Box for deliveries through the season. And we partnered with uh, Bodie's Moonlight Garden, Jody Bo Ropke Bodie there from the Algona area. They have a well-established single farm CSA. North Iowa Fresh in 2018 was uh, had just piloted the CSA model. They had We had been doing some wholesale, looked at CSA, and if we want to move to the next slide, Michael, um, Allison Moon and Andrea Elvisizer were also key in this project. So this grant was written as a Sayre Farmer Rancher grant, similar to uh, the program that Jordan was just talking about. We were, as I said, looking to expand CSA membership for North Iowa Fresh at the same time, we are seeing national statistics and state level experience of CSA numbers showing some stagnation. And we're seeing consumers um, really showing some preference for convenience. And we're also seeing meal kits coming onto the market. So we sort of were looking at those dynamics. So keep in mind, those are the assumptions that we were operating when we developed this proposal. And then we were awarded the proposal in 2019 with the goal of research and development of local tailored meal kits, right? We've been seeing these on the, on the marketplace, but so like, well, what would we really take to create one of those around our local ingredients? So we worked on the development of the recipes for those meal kits in 2019 and marketed those in 2020. We were looking for these to be a way to attract and retain CSA members and just the design of the project was 
also a way to build some relationships between subscribers and producer members. However, um, we do have the impact of 2020 that, that impacted a bit of that project design. So go ahead to the next slide. And here we're going to give a quick overview of the process. And Michael, you can go ahead to move to the next one. This is just a real quick look at contents of one of the kits. We started by looking at several of the commercial meal kits, plated, home chef, blue apron. We also looked at um, local, local crate. This is one the probably the only time we were able to get together and work in person because pretty soon we were starting to feel the effects of um, COVID as we looked at our plans for development in 2020. But we were looking at how uh, much recyclable packaging there was. We were looking at the quality of the ingredients. We were looking at the taste, uh, how well the quantities um, came out, how the timing of the, of the cooking as well. So let's go to the next site. And that gave us the basis to sort of say, OK, that's kind of how commercial kits work. And then we look at our um, own kits. And that kind of takes us to looking at we wanted to feature um, abundant crops and crops that maybe our, our customers were not as familiar with. We both, both farms um, are primarily uh, vegetable and produce, so produce, uh, vegetables and fruit. But we have within North Iowa Fresh some pretty established relationships with meat producers and honey producers. And we were wanting to find ways to build some of those other um, ingredients into the meal kits. And we also really wanted to look at how to minimize our waste. So let's go to the next slide. We're starting to move into the recipe development and then we really had to drill down into our seasonal production schedule and try to sort of project when what kind of products were going to be together and available at the same time as we're trying to build this whole meal kit and try to maximize that look for those opportunities to bring in other products on um, meat and honey and eggs as well let's say let's go on to the next one the recipe development was one of the areas that we spent quite a bit of time in pulling favorite recipes from both of the, um, from my family's CSA, from Joanne's CSA, um, some other examples. Um, Allison is our lead chef. And so we did testing, we did tweaking and retesting and really came up with an excellent selection of eight different meal kits. Uh, we offered them June through September a vegetable option and a, and a meat option. Let's go on to the next slide. We, as I said, we were able to sort of take advantage of the relationships that North Iowa Fresh has, its main uh, producers with vegetables, but also working in close partnership with a number of meat producers and a honey producer. So that made bringing those other ingredients in a little bit more feasible for North Iowa Fresh. Let's go to the next slide. Was not quite as easy uh, for Bodie's Moonlight Garden. Um, recipe card, we spent a lot of time in this development, uh, not only trying to capture photos of the finished dishes through our recipe testing, but looking at the steps of the um, process as well, figuring out how to explain how to take a meal kit and break the steps down so that all the items are ready at the same time. It's interesting how much time that that can take. Um, let's go to the next slide. So we have a really nice set of those. Spent some time, uh, Joanne being the lead on our branding and marketing, really looking at a logo and a marketing um, framework that could work for either, um, either of the businesses, either Bodie's Moonlight Garden or North Iowa Fresh. We didn't brand it specifically to either one of those thinking that we might be sharing that, and then use that seasonal chef uh, brand for our social media marketing, go ahead. The next slide. And now we're getting into the thicker weeds of this project. There is a lot of really complicated compli of, uh, uh, logistics. We're not only talking about local ingredients, not only talking about fresh produce and meat, we're talking about non-local ingredients and how to, thank you, how to keep those in a cold chain and how to manage those across recipe development and translate those to producer delivery. So let me just say that that was one of the insights of this model in the CSA world that we we're living in. Let's jump to the next slide. And we're also going to look at the nitty gritty details of the price. This is product price per box. And I think maybe you can see um, the bottom of the slide 
I'm not available to see it from here, but for the vegetables, the average product price per box was just under $21. Average price per the meat box was just under $25. Let's go to the next slide quickly. And then when we start to look at that and build in the other costs, the packaging costs, the production coordination and packing in the boxes, the marketing, the printing of the newsletter, and we had some assistant, assistance with some of the non-local product breakdown that we were not even charged for, thanks to a partner. Well, you can see that we came out with, you know, 59 to 60 some dollars per box. And if you look at the upper left corner, we sold those boxes for $40 each. So we have some real issues on the, the financial arrangement. So let's, um, that's certainly an insight. And that's the advantage of having the support from a SARE grant to let us do this kind of piloting. So it doesn't work for us, either North Iowa Fresh or Bodie's Moonlight Garden to move forward with this particular model. That might work for other businesses. It's gonna take some hard work looking at those financial numbers, but if it's an enterprise you're interested in adding, or if you have a food business that you could partner with, you might consider that we're more than happy to share other insights and resources from this business. We can jump ahead to the next. And we must be just about out of time. North Iowa Fresh is gonna take those recipes from last year. We're gonna look at some other recipes and really try to drive a little more direct linkage between recipes and our meal boxes to really encourage our customers to turn their weekly box into a meal kit. Working really closely with Healthy Harvest, which has a great recipe database. We're just gonna take those, put those on their database and drive our customers there and sort of build on it from that way and sort of offer a little bit of a tweak on that. Thanks. And the last that I think- Thank you, is we're, we're actually at time here, Thanks. so yeah. Yep, there's here. my contact. Thank you very much. Give a call Thank you so much. Um, next, we have T.D. Hollub, who will be talking about his crop washer, their crop washer. Um, T.D.? Yeah, uh, so my name's T.D. Hollub. Uh, we run Garden Oasis Farm here in Coggin, Iowa. Um, everybody did a lot better job with slides than me, so I don't have very many. Uh, if you want to hit the next one here real quick. <clears throat> um, just a little bit about the farm. We started in 2013. Um, you know, we started out small. A lot of people's stories are the same. Right now we're at about 10 acres, which we produce on about seven of those. Um, and we also do pasture raised chickens, um, and then we grow most of our produce um, in one large field, but we're starting to add in some smaller ones around the farm as we learn that being closer to home and having all that stuff closer to home uh, actually works out a lot better for us. Um, if you want to hit the next slide here, um, I'll talk a little bit first here, and then I will uh, have you play that video. But um, so this last winter before the pandemic hit, um, I had a friend of the farm send me a link to a produce washer. And initially the, the price was a little prohibitive. Uh, I didn't know much about it, um, but one of the philosophies on our farm or just one of the things I like to, um, you know, kind of pay attention to is efficiency as well as, um, you know, I like to make work a little bit easier. So. One of our big bottlenecks was cleaning the produce. Um, as many of you guys can relate that do vegetables, um, everybody works at a different tempo. Some people are really good at cleaning. Some people are really good at harvesting. Um, and we were just getting not necessarily mixed results, but it was taking more time than I thought that it probably needed to, to just essentially clean vegetables. Um, so after I kind of heard um, about this being available. It just so happened it was available in Iowa City. Uh, they ship out of Pennsylvania. They're available from Nolts if anybody's interested in buying one. I think new, they're like close to $8,000. Um, but I was able to work out a price. Uh, this thing had been used for a season. I was pretty happy with the condition it was in and, and what I thought it could bring to the farm. Uh, so I'm gonna have you go ahead and play that video on the left side there and it just kind of shows you how it works and I'll be quiet. Um, it may be a little bit loud, but um, hopefully it, it works for you guys. Maybe it won't make any noise. So basically what this thing does, um, which is what's kind of nice, is it, it has the ability to clean bunch produce, uh, root you know, just bare roots. Uh, we've cleaned lettuce, we'll clean kale. Uh, so pretty much any, any vegetable that you can think of, uh, we clean with this thing. 
Um, so basically how it works, you can see here in the video that it enters first there through like a, it's a low pressure, high volume water rinse. So it's, it's basically like a pre-rinse. Just imagine this thing is like a car wash essentially. Uh, so it passes through there. Um, that particular portion of the water is recirculated that comes from the bottom. Uh, you fill this thing up with um, some water and it recirculates that, goes through there. And then you have the option to run a high pressure, low volume portion of the washer as well. So what that does, um, it's basically um, got two high pressure nozzles that spin top and bottom. And uh, basically, as that comes through there, those things rotate and you can use high pressure when it requires it. But if it doesn't require it, um, you don't have to turn that portion of it on. So it's, it's kind of nice that you have that flexibility. Additionally, the, the conveyor speed is adjustable so you can make that go faster, slower, um, depending on what produce you're cleaning, how long you want it to sit there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so on the next slide here, um, I'll just kind of go over a few of the things that uh, we find that it does well, or what it does. I kind of touch base on the low pressure, high volume. Um, on the high pressure end, you are able to adjust that from 500 to 1000 PSI. Um, something that it does that we didn't even really think about or wasn't a huge selling point, but if I were to ever sell this thing would be one of my biggest selling points is that it cleans totes. <laughs> so everybody knows how awful it is to clean, uh, you know, your harvest totes or anything like that. Um, and this, this particular machine is two foot wide. So any tote that can fit through there, you can actually push right through there and it will come out cleaned and sanitized if you're putting sanitizer in that recirculated water. Um, so, that was kind of the one downfall is that recirculated water kind of made me nervous, but we were um, able to put the sanitizer in there and, and kind of felt like, you know, at the end we're running a fresh water rinse or we're running that high pressure. So we're getting that clean water on there anyway. Um, the conveyor, like I said, can be set to different speeds and the nozzles, both when it enters and exits. So the high pressure and low pressure, those are adjustable up and down. So if you have a very delicate crop, you can raise it up. If you have one that can take a little bit more of a beating or you need more pressure, you can lower it. Uh, so on the next slide here, we are going to talk a little bit about what crops it works with. So we really, really liked it for kale, believe it or not. We sell quite a bit of kale uh, to our local co-op. So. We really liked it for that. Um, it works really good on any kind of greens. Lettuces, some of them can be a little bit touchy, so you don't want to use uh, that for every style of lettuce. But we we're actually able to even clean uh, lettuce mix, which we'll just put that into um, like laundry bags, reusable laundry bags. And we can run it through there a couple times with that. Um, and it seems to work quite well. We'll do that with spinach as well. Uh, as you can see on the list here, any of the root crops that you can imagine work well. Uh, we use it on eggplant, if they're a little bit dusty, peppers, cucumbers, summer squash, tomatoes, uh, winter squash, uh, sweet potatoes, it was very nice on. Um, these carrots in this picture here, um, if they have a lot of soil on them, they're really heavily soiled before they go into the, the washer, uh, we'll actually pre-soak them. So whether that means in the tote that they're in, we'll soak them or um, we'll put them into a big bulk tote and soak them. And that just helps loosen up the dirt. A lot of people do that with everything. Uh, we'll actually run our lettuce through that as well. So then we can just pull the lettuce right out and uh, run it through the conveyor. Um, just a couple of things that I've noticed about it after having it for a season. Uh, we've been able to really reduce the amount of people that we need in our wash pack operation. I was actually able to finish out the season. So from August, to um, November, it was just myself and one other crew member and we were able to keep up with uh, 120 member CSA as well as all our wholesale and on our on-farm sales. And the, the one thing that I attribute that to is this washer because it made things so much faster. 
we were able to pack right off the conveyor line so we didn't have to set it out to dry. It was coming right off the conveyor going into a tote and then going into the walk-in cooler. Uh, it was fun. It just makes things easier. It's streamlined. There's not uh, as much, uh, the can't, it doesn't allow for much human error. It's set the speed and you basically got to keep up with it. Even if you have to run something through there twice, it's still usually a lot faster than hand washing it. Um, and just a couple things to consider if you are looking at getting one of these, it does take 220 volt electricity. It's also very long, it's about 10 foot long. And when you, I don't have a video or a picture of it, but it opens so that you can fill the bottom section with water. And when you open that, that requires about a 10 foot ceiling. So you got to kind of consider the area that you're putting it in. So hi TD. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to stop you right there. We gotta go to our next person. Thank you so much. Um, um, Lauren Aspruth will be finishing up today with a talk about the role of PFI's farmer network. Yeah, great. So I think actually you need to stop sharing and then I can go ahead and share mine. Uh, Thank you. Great. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> stop video. Sorry, I'm not sure how to do this. Oh, it's okay. Um, so if you go to the bottom and it usually, oh, okay. Stop share. Sure. Stop share. There we go. Okay. Okay. Slideshow. Okay. Cause so can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I've had the opportunity to look at the PFI member survey as part of my dissertation research. So I'm going to go through some of those findings and I'm sure some of you have filled out the member survey last year. So I'm looking at a subgroup of this 2020 member survey, um, corn and soy farmers in corn belt states. Um, and I'm interested in understanding more about this group being sort of the largest membership contingency in PFI, as well as being pretty critical for shifting practices and the corn belt towards more regenerative agriculture. So I wanted to zoom out first and give you a glimpse of how PFI corn and soy farmers um, compare to PFI growers as a whole and to other growers in the region. And so a big takeaway is that PFI producers on average are younger um, than the regional average. They have um, been farming longer. They have larger farms and in particular uh, corn and soy farmers have, have much larger farms and they have lower security of tenure. And so we're looking at that in terms of percent acres owned over the total acres of farmland. Um, so I'm the, the big question I'm sort of asking in this research is what is the role of PFI in furthering the use of conservation practices amongst this group, um, these corn and soy growers? And so let's take a look at the adoption of conservation practices. Uh, and hopefully you can see my cursor here as well. And so we're looking at adoption in terms of a question on the member survey that included cover crops, no-till farming, conservation tillage, extended rotations. And these all have really high adoption amongst PFI corn and soy growers. Um, cover crops have up in over 85% adoption. Um, and then also contract grazing of cover crops, buffer filter strips, no use of synthetic inputs, organic practices, drainage management, flame electric weeding, and those have all a little lower adoption. So our hypothesis was that those that participate in PFI are more likely to use conservation practices. And so to determine this, we zoomed out uh, to place participation in PFI alongside other factors that we also think influence the use of conservation practices um, and things that we can measure with the member survey, like age, length of time farming, percent income farming, security of land tenure, farm size, participation in equip. Uh, and then to see how participation in PFI influences adoption relative to these other factors. So through some statistical analysis, we found that there were a few factors associated with the adoption. Um, age was positively associated, percent income farming, and security of land tenure was negatively associated. Um, so the proportion of acres owned to the total is associated with a decrease in the use of conservation practices. Um, but as we thought, the most statistically significant factor was participation in PFI. 
So now that we know that participation in PFI has the strongest association with adoption relative to other factors, we decided to look at growers in terms of both our adoption of conservation and our participation. So here we have on the bottom of this graph, we have participation, which we put into an index and adoption over here. And so we can see generally an upward trend that as participation in PFI increases, so does adoption of conservation practices. Um, and all of these dots being the different members that fall into these um, into this participation group, into this adoption group. And we can also see that the largest group um, uh, in, in PFI into these corn and sorghum sor growers in the survey were low adopters and low participators at 122 relative to the high adopters, um, low participators and low adopters. Um, so we wanna know what are some of the key differences between these, between these four groups and in particular, how do low adopters and low participators compare to other groups like high adopters and high participators and how can low participators become more involved in PFI and, and hopefully adopt more. And the idea behind this is that understanding these groups more will help uh, both in targeting program to low adopters to identify successful strategies and characteristics of high adopters in order to sort of move these low adopter, low participators um, and high participators up into this high adopter, high participate category. So what are some of the differences between low adopters, low participators and the group we're aiming for at high adopt, high participates? Um, so high adopters on average are younger than low. Um, they have smaller farms. They have less security of tenure. They participate more in equip, which we would probably imagine. Um, they get more of their income from farming and they have been farming for less years. So just looking at low and high adopters, we can also see an interesting difference in the importance of information sources on farming, which is also a question on the member survey. <laughs> so in this graph, we can see that um, the scale of importance here is on the left. And these are all of the sources that were listed on the member survey in terms of uh, ranked importance. And so we can see generally that universities, YouTube, online video, farming publications are all really highly ranked by farmers, both high adopters and low adopters alike. Um, but we can see specific differences in terms of high adopters, which are these, this group here in the blue and low adopters, this group in, uh, in the orange. We can see that they generally favor universities, online videos, uh, website, social media more than low adopters. And we might call this sort of open sourced um, information sources. Whereas low adopters on average value more than high adopters, TV, newspaper, local radio, agribusiness, farming publication, which we might call private or for pay. So that was sort of an interesting finding. Um, and so since we know that statistically significant association with adopt, the PFI has a strong and statistically significant association, association with adoption of conservation practices, we have to ask sort of, well, what is it about PFI that works so well? So what is it about PFI that brings people in, um, supports them to use conservation practices and how can it be improved to better suit the needs of those low adopters, low participators? Um, so I'm going to try and answer these questions in a second round of research that I recently finished with um, 25 in-depth interviews with corn and soy growers and PFI, um, and more on that coming soon. But we can take a look at this in terms of the member survey. It tells us a little bit about how you how folks have um, found the association with PFI impacted farm and, and their life. And so we have a lot of folks that developed friendships, um, social support from like-minded farmers was another big group. Um, form, found new ideas, new information, um, increased knowledge, learned from others' experiences, benefited from shared advice, helped develop ideas, develop business contacts. Um, those were a lot of things that folks were saying on the membership survey. So, so if we wanted to look in, in PFI going forward, the membership survey also gives us a little bit of, of information on that. And so one of the questions was, which areas should PFI place the most emphasis in the future? And so by far the most, the, 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 the highly flagged categories were soy health, cropper crops, and third crops. Um, On-farm research and demonstration, beginning farmers, profitability, water quality, marketing, market development, <clears throat> those all sort of came in close seconds. Another question was what more could PFI do to help you reach your farm goals? And so a couple of folks uh, had some interesting responses that I wanted to highlight. Um, one was highlight the resources that are helping people achieve their goals. Um, people skills training, suggestions and assistance in finding a mentee, um, provide more examples of successful farmers, add space to your website, post jobs for sale wanted ads, more research on behavior change, keep encouraging me. Um, and my favorite was print money. 
So that's all I have for now, um, but please reach out to me with any questions or comments or feedback, and I'd be really interested in hearing from you and hopefully have more information soon that we can post on the website. That was great. Thank you everybody for hanging in there. 